Hello, I'm Ray with yet another podcast episode. By the time you listen to this on Sunday the 5th, that's when this one's coming out, it'll be 2020. So Happy New Year to you all. And thanks for listening to my podcast. I just had a quick look. I think this is number 28, is it? Or heading for 30 podcasts anyway. One a week for the last 30 odd weeks. And hopefully I can keep that going. Now, I was wondering what to do this one about. What should I talk about this time? I had an email from Kirsty in North Carolina and Kirsty said, do you know where the expression I've got the wrong end of the stick comes from? She said that she's very interested in all these old English sayings, but a lot of them she can't find the meaning. Well, I, I think I know that one, Kirsty. I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, my one that I've thought about since I was a child when I first heard it is a, a sort of exclamation. Well, I'll go to the foot of our stairs. Now, why would anyone go to the foot of their stairs? I can't find the answer. I have scoured the internet. Since I was a child, I've been asking people, what does that mean? Don't know. Even my old grandfather, who used it a lot in in the 50s, he didn't know what it meant. He just said, well, it means I'll go to the foot of our stairs. Yes, well, I know that much as a form of um, surprise or shock or I don't know. I'll go to the foot of our stairs. Let's start with Kirsty's wrong end of the stick. Now, Kirsty, from what I understand, I'm not going to go into this in graphic detail because it's not very nice. In the oldie, 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 oldie days, long, long time before we were around, toilets were a hole in the ground with a piece of wood across the top with a hole in the bit of wood that you'd sit on. Now, I'm not going to go into much more detail than that. The stick was next to this toilet thing. Um, and when things in the hole got a bit too high, you'd prod it all with the stick to get it down so you could then sit on the plank of wood. Yes, I hope you're not having breakfast or anything or your evening meal. So obviously anyone going in there at night, there, you know, there was no electric light or anything like that, they could perhaps inadvertently grab the wrong end of the stick. Enough said on that. So that's that one, Kirsty. As far as I can tell, that is the meaning. There are other suggestions that people have come up with but I think the general consensus is that that's what the stick was used for. Another one I've been looking up is stone the crows. That's another sort of surprise or exclamation. Stone the crows. Now the crows from what I understand the crows c-r-o-z-e rather than the birds that was that's the, the sort of plate at the end of a wooden barrel and you'd, you'd, you'd hit that or you'd stone it or something. But I don't like that one at all. I like the, the, the explanation that says in the old days on farms, crows would attack and eat baby lambs, newborn lambs and that sort of thing. So you'd stone the crows. You would literally throw stones at the crows. But I, I don't know why that has become a phrase or a saying, stone the crows. I think from what I've read again, Whoever first coined that phrase probably just liked it. Stone the crows. I don't know. That, but that's a good one. I like that. Stone the crows. And, and I remember that from back in the 50s. Another one I remember from the 50s. I heard this recently on an American TV program. This woman said, wind your neck in. And I thought, wind your neck in on an American TV program. I remember that from the 1950s at school where you say to a kid, oh, what have you got there? Well, wind your neck in, you know, in other words, mind your own business, wind your neck in. Now, I thought that was an old British thing. I mean, that, it's obvious what that means. Where it's come from, I don't know. What When I first heard it, I pictured a swan with a long neck, sort of retracting his head, winding his neck in or moving his neck back. But uh, yeah, that's another good one, wind your neck in. Now, do you remember people saying, my giddy aunt, I've heard that recently on TV as well. My giddy aunt. Now, this doesn't mean that your auntie is giddy or dizzy and going to fall over. It's, again, a sort of explanation, a surprise. Oh, my giddy aunt. From what I can understand, I mean, I've never known where this comes from. And most of them, I don't think most people know where most of these come from. I don't think anyone knows where most of these come from. But the word giddy apparently has been used to mean mad or stupid. For over a thousand years, you know, millions of millions of thousands of years, well, a thousand years ago, the old English word giddy, apparently, that's G-I-D-I, that derives from the word God. 
So those who were labelled giddy were possessed of God. I don't quite know what all this has got to do with it, really. Uh, 16th century, I've made some notes here, look, to mean affected with vertigo. Begad life was the word turn giddy. But I mean, basically, out of all my notes here, where I've looked this up, the term giddy aunt, no one seems to know where it's come from. But I do remember that being used a lot. There were also, there's a lot of rude ones that I can't mention on here, of course, to do with aunts and things like that. No, you know, why not, oh, my giddy uncle? I suppose there must be some truth in going back over a thousand years where it was derived from the word God and all that business. So perhaps uncle wasn't derived from the word God. I don't know. But I find it all very interesting anyway. Barking up the wrong tree, that means making a mistake or a false assumption. Something, you know, barking up the wrong tree, you're going the wrong way about it. You That comes, apparently, uh, hunting dogs literally at the bottom of a tree, uh, barking up at the tree where they mistakenly think their quarry is. They're, they're, you know, the bird or whatever is up the top of the tree. They've got the wrong tree. Is the tree next to that one or over there or wherever? So they're barking up the wrong tree. So that's where that comes from. That's, that's fairly, I said, not self-explanatory, but uh, that's got a nice, easy explanation to it. Unlike, uh, I'll go to the foot of our stairs Still none the wiser on that one. Nothing to do with this, I know, but I just thought of the old Cockney rhyming slang. A, a lot of that you could work out, couldn't you? Um, apples and pears, stairs. I remember a, a kid at school, he said to me, he gave me some cigarette cards, and he said, put that in your skyrocket. Now, put those in your skyrocket. Uh, that was pocket, skyrocket, pocket. In fact, there have been books written on Cockney rhyming slang which is, is quite interesting. I wonder how that all started. Obviously came, I don't know, apples and pears, stairs. Someone started the rhyming business. But uh, nothing to do with this, I know, but I just thought I'd mention that. I recently heard a, a lad, he was about, what, 14, 15? Um, he was in a shop, and he said, Oh, my word! And I was surprised. My grandmother used to say that, again, back in the 50s. Oh, my word! I think where that comes from, from what I understand is, uh, instead of saying, oh my God, which might offend some people, they started saying, oh my word. But to hear a lad of what, 14, 15, he was no more than that, say that in this day and age, when that was something my grandmother was saying in the 50s. I remember, her, oh my, she used to say, leave off as well. Oh my word, leave off. I wonder what that leave, I mean, it means stop it, doesn't it? But leave off something else. I've got to mention this. I've got to. Telling the time. Funnily enough, at the moment, I'm looking at the clock, it's 25 to 10 in the morning. OK, 25 to 10. Why did people used to say, and some still do, it's 5 and 20 to 10? Listen to those seagulls. It's 5 and 20 to 10, or it's 5 and 20 past 3. Why, why say that? That is most peculiar. And again, I can't find out. Why not say, instead of, say, quarter past 2, why not say it's five and ten past two? <laughs> or if it's twenty to twenty to four, why not say it's five and fifteen to four? I mean, why? I don't know. That is odd. It's five at the moment, and this is true. That I'm looking at the clock. It is actually five and twenty to ten, or twenty-five to ten. Five and twenty to ten. I don't know. I don't understand that. Five and twenty past eight. That is peculiar. If anyone knows, let me know. I, I would just love to know where that's come from. I've looked it up. All these things have various... People have come up with various exclamations and, oh, it means this and it came from that. But there are so many... Well, like everything on the internet, there's so much contradictory stuff out there. You just, disinformation and you just don't know what to believe. The English language is changing all the time, isn't it? And it has been since the beginning of time, I suppose, or the beginning of people first speaking to each other. Lots of examples. For example, transistor radio back in the 60s, that was your tranny. You know, I'm going down the beach with my tranny in the summer. Well, you can't say that now. Tranny has got a different meaning. Mind you, people these days probably wouldn't understand transistor radio because that's all moved on. It's MP3 and phones and stuff. That's just one example of how it's changed. You know, you used to carry a tranny around with you. Uh, and the term gay, of course, that's another one that's changed. It still has the original meaning, but of course, I don't know, it's not so easy to use it, is it? There are a lot of, obviously, sayings and phrases that we don't hear anymore. I remember in my teens, um, 
people, other lads, referring to girls as a bit of skirt. I don't know, a bit of... Where did that come from? Who, who first thought of calling a girl a bit of skirt? I, I don't know. Well, they were chicks, and they're still baby, of course. You know, you call your girl your baby. Um, I've never quite understood that, because a baby is a baby, isn't it? It's not an adult woman. Why would you call an adult woman a baby? That's another weird one. I won't look it up. There are far too many to look up. You know, we'd be here all day. Well, we'd be here all week if I was looking up every one of them. Just out of interest, I did look up a bit of skirt on the internet. Primarily used in Australia and the UK, so we're guilty of that. Uh, us lot and you lot down under, we're guilty of that. Why are you down under and we're not down under? Really, we're, we're down under equally, aren't we? Because there is no up and down. If you look at the, the earth, if you look at the globe, there is no up and down. Depending, well, it depends which way up you, I don't know. Anyway, that's another thing. Uh, a bit of skirt, it's actually a, a very attractive or sexually alluring woman, okay? Then it says a derogatory or offensive comment. Well, if it's an attractive woman, why is that offensive? I don't know, we'll get into that. But there we are, that's a bit of skirt or a bit of fluff. <laughs> a bit of fluff, I've no idea. I think we'll leave that one there and move on. Do girls call us lads? A bit of trouser. Now, there's a thing. Why aren't we a bit of trouser? Anyway, let's move on. It Look, as mad as a hatter. There's a good one. As mad as a hatter. Make a pig's ear of it. That's a good one. I mean, that's, that's still used, isn't it? Make a rod for your own back. That's still used. There are so many that are still used today, although they're very, very old. Face the music. Don't faff about. Faff? Where does that come from? Faff? Let me just quickly look this one up. Faffing about, uh, most heard in the UK, blah, blah, blah. Oh, it mean to you, well, we know what it means. Dither, fuss, flap about. Uh, since Oh, since the 19th century, there we are. I thought faff was a kind of modern word, you know, the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years. Don't faff about, but it's not. It's, uh, oh, here we are, look. 1874, there's a reference to faff. So in 1874, they were saying, don't faff about. Well, there we are. I didn't know that. Fag end. Well, we know fag end, don't we? Fair and square. Um, daft as a brush. That's a good one. Why is a brush daft? It's a bit like deaf as a doorpost, isn't it? What is it? Dead? What's the nail? Oh, hit the nail on the head. That's, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Rather than hit your thumb or the piece of wood or whatever, you've hit the nail directly on the head. So you're spot on. Daft as a brush. Well, we know what it means. It says they're very stupid or foolish. We know that. It could be to do with as soft as a brush. And the brush is the tail of a fox. Soft is a Northern English term for stupid, apparently. And fox's tails are, in fact, quite soft to the touch. So does that fit? You're a bit stupid. You're daft. As daft as a brush. A soft. Yeah. You see where I'm coming from? Now, that's interesting, isn't it? It's... It, that that sounds plausible to me. I like that. The darkest hour. There we are. Darkest hour is just before dawn. Well, I suppose that's sort of... There we are. Dead as a dodo. Oh, that's... Yes, this is dead as a doornail. That, that's the one I was uh, on about just now. Dead as a doornail. There, oh, a sandwich short of a picnic. I love this. Now, what is it? You, your tuppence short of a, a shilling. Not the sharpest tool in the box. These are all sort of self-explanatory, aren't they? But I like the short of ones. An acorn short of a tree or something. <laughs> but I do like the sandwich short of a picnic. Sent to Coventry. Right? Now that's obviously, you know, you're not speaking to someone. You send them to Coventry. That means you're not speaking to them, as we know. Now I'm just looking up here. It was a punishment. Let's have a look here. Um... The story is that Cromwell sent a group of royalist soldiers to be imprisoned in Coventry around 1648. See, a lot of these go back a long way, don't they? The locals, who were parliamentary supporters, shunned them and refused to consort with them. Well, there's a lot more about it. I'm not going to read all that. Cause, as I say, well, again, we'll be here all day. But that was actually being sent to the, the place, Coventry itself. Separate the sheep from the goats. Well, we know all that. Shaggy dog stuff. There's so many. I wonder how many there are. Baker's dozen. Well, that's that's thirteen, isn't it? A baker's dozen. I think we all know that one. Wasn't that to do with um, sort of weights and measures, people? If a baker supply was asked to supply a dozen loaves and he was one short, didn't he get 
he got hanged or something, didn't he? He got executed. <laughs> so what bakers did, they made 13 loaves. So if there was one short, it would still be a dozen. Something, that's how the story goes. Is that true? I don't know. I'm not going to look that one up. Bats in the Belfry. There we are, Bats in the Belfry. Whipper snapper, that's a good old whistleblower. Well, that's often on the on the news now, isn't it? About whistleblowers. Uh, I'm just looking all these up in this book I've got here. This, I look, the writing's on the wall. Oh, there's the wrong end of the stick. And so it goes on. Jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah, well, we know that one. The jury's still out. Now, that's a good one, isn't it? I think that's used a lot today. Where does that come from? The jury is still out. It says here... Uh, New York Daily Times, May 1850. There we are. The Gardiner trial, jury are still out with no prospect of immediate agreement. That seems to be where it's come from and it's caught on. I remember a friend of mine looking up naughty words once. Uh, I'm, I won't obviously mention the words here, but I'm talking about the, the really, really bad naughty words, you know, especially the two extremely naughty words. Do you know, when we were at school, us kids, you know, we thought that was a modern term, or they were modern terms, these naughty words that you should never, ever use. But they're not. They go back hundreds and hundreds of years. I remember looking up these words with this friend of mine, and they are literally hundreds and hundreds of years old. And the origin, the meaning, is quite interesting to look them up. I'm not going to mention them here, obviously, but... You yeah, look them up at some stage if if you get them in if you're that if you're so inclined. But that's interesting. Another thing that I find interesting are names. Now, someone like Johnson, he would have been John's son. Now, if you go back, presumably John. I don't think there were surnames. I think it was like just John. So there was John's son. So someone would say, "Have you seen John's son?" They said, "Yeah, he's on his iPad over there." They no, wouldn't be on his iPad, would he? <laughs> He'd be oh, he's on the old farm old down there. He so he was known as John's son. So what happened when John's son had a son? He got married. Well, they didn't get married then, didn't they? I don't know. Lived together, shacked up. There's another one, shacked up together. John's son and his bit of skirt. <laughs> sorry, his young lady. They had a baby, a son. What was he? Was he called John's son? Son? Yeah, Johnson's son. But uh, no, you see what I mean? And, and words like Mr. Shepherd. I wonder what he did for a living, Mr. Shepherd. Mr. Farmer. That's a good one. Mr. Coleman. He made mustard. But apart from making mustard, Mr. Coleman. All these come from somewhere, don't they? Mr. Wood. There's those seagulls again. Mr. Seagull. There's no such name as that. There might be. You could be. Yeah, Mr. Seagull. Why not? So names are interesting. I think originally they didn't, as I say, they didn't have surnames. It was probably just Fred and Joe. <laughs> so you'd have Fredson. No, there wasn't a Fredson, though. There's not Fredson. But uh, that's something else that might be interesting to look into at some stage. One or two others just come to mind. Uh, Mr. Cartwright, Mr. Wheelwright. Yeah, they were Cartwrights and Wheelwrights, weren't they? And Mr. Hoover, of course. Now, the name Hoover, if you look it up in the dictionary, it actually does mean to vacuum the floor. But that's a trade name. It's a trade name as well, isn't it? Hoover. Just go back to Cockney rhyming slang again. You've heard the the term a load of cobblers. Now, I always thought that was to do with shoes, your know, shoemaking cobblers. I've just looked this up in the book and it says here, this is a classic of Cockney rhyming slang, but it has nothing to do with shoemakers, but originates from cobblers alls. OK, that's the pointed hand tools that cobblers use to pierce holes in leather. So what does cobblers awls rhyme with? Balls. And it says here, meaning testicles. There we are. So a load of cobblers. That's good. I live and learn. I must admit, looking through this book, I've learned quite a lot in the last hour or so. It's very interesting. I also heard on TV the other day a bit of How's Your Father. Remember the Carry On films? It was in that. A bit of How's Your Father. <laughs> <laughs> hanky panky now there's a good one hanky panky is trickery or it's sort of double dealing and also more recently sexual shenanigans that's what it says here more recently sexual shenanigans so what's the oh, here we are the origin um it's one of those nonsense terms that were just made up as having an attractive sort of rhyme like bees knees the mutt nuts hanky panky the words have no real meaning 
Although it is possible, I'm just reading this, that Hanky Panky derives as a variant of Hokey Pokey or Hocus Pocus. The term is first recorded in relation to its original trickery meaning in the first edition of Punch, or the, ah, oh yeah, Punch, September 1841, there we are. So that's something that's been changed from a bit of trickery or double meaning into some sort of sexual thing. It, it now means a bit of how's your father. <laughs> a bit of how's your father, a bit of the other. Goodness me, that have it off. The, I mean, I did watch a Carry On film the other day. What was it? Carry On Matron I watched. They are they are so bad. They're absolutely brilliant. I think, I mean, it's sort of, it's Marmite, isn't it? Now there's another, there's another uh, expression. Marmite, you love it or you hate it. I love the Carry On films because, as I say, they are so bad, they're brilliant. It's a bit like Tommy Cooper's jokes where he walks onto the stage with a, a saw on his head, you know, a wood-cutting saw on his head. And he says, I've got a sore head. <laughs> oh dear, stop it. I, I find that funny. I don't know why. It's so, I think it's just so bad. It's funny. Going back to the Carry On films, you know, Sid James or someone would walk into a bar and there's the Buxom barmaid and he'd look at her chest and he'd say, how are you both? I mean, it's so corny, isn't it? It's so bad. It's brilliant. <laughs> Where are we? We're now oh, uh, just over 21 minutes into the podcast episode do you want any more no you don't want any more do you i think we've had enough for this sunday's episode how about uh, suggestions for next sunday anyone got any ideas thanks to kirsty for setting this one off thank you kirsty excellent from north carolina hope the weather's nice and warm there i don't know what the weather's like there probably better than the uk it's not that warm here okay thanks for listening happy new year and healthy Definitely healthy New Year. Don't worry about money too much. Healthy New Year. And I shall see you all next Sunday. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye for now.